Welcome everyone to the third session of the third annual Humanities Podcast Network Symposium. This year we're focusing on how local contacts matter for humanities podcasting. While podcasts seem like they may be a placeless medium, they are local in ways both obvious and subtle. This year we're asking how podcasts that we make, teach, and consume connect with the places we live. And apologies if you've heard this spiel already, um, but we want to make sure that we tell everyone who's new um, all of the useful things they need to know about the symposium today. So we have four sessions, two of which have already taken place, podcasting a scholarship and podcasting pedagogies. You are here for the craft of podcasts, making, distributing, and listening. And the next session, if you guys want to stick around, uh, will take place at 5 p.m. Eastern time, and that is Podcasts in the World, Communities, Industries, and Social Justice. Hi, everyone. My name is Rebecca. I'm another one of the HPN organizers. And just so you're aware, each session meets for one hour right here in the Zoom room. We have four total. This is number three, focusing on craft. The session leaders, the four of us, will begin the conversation on the topic. And then we're going to open it up to all attendees for the second half of the session. We encourage you to ask questions and share your insights and experiences. But we ask that you keep yourself on mute until you're called upon and be respectful to the conference participants. If you haven't worked with us before, the Humanities Podcast Network is a collective of instructors, scholars, and independent creators dedicated to the transformative impact of audio, media, and the human voice. We work horizontally to empower people to make and use podcasts for education and scholarship, and you can check out our website to learn more at humanitiespodnetwork.org. The Zoom room will be open after the session finishes if you want to stay and chat. And for the first time ever, there's an in-person component for the symposium. You can check out our meetup list. We're going to drop that in the chat momentarily. There are 10 cities across North America and one in the UK where you can join people in person to get to know podcasters in your area. In addition, today's sessions will be recorded and, put, and posted on our YouTube channel after the conference. And if you don't want to appear in the recording, all you need to do is make sure you keep your audio and video off. If you have questions for the session leaders, you can put them in the chat at any time during the session or raise your hand once the Q&A portion begins. Thank you for attending and we look forward to hearing your voice. Now we'll drop it over to the session leaders and we're gonna start right here. Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca Berry. I've been a podcaster since 2019 and I am one of the HPN organizers this year. In addition, I'm creator and host of the Berry Bunch Picks Flicks, which is a podcast in which I trick my family into talking about their emotions under the guise of discussing movie analysis with me. Prior to that, I was one of the co-founders and audio engineers for Legal Knowledge Podcast at the University of Virginia Law Library. And I also served as assistant producer on Democracy in Danger podcast for UVA's Karsh Institute of Democracy, for which our team won a Webby this past spring, which was very exciting. These days, I'm working at the Yale School of Management. I help to be a planner for continuing education and summits um, for individuals and corporations interested in learning more about business and entrepreneurship. I'll pass it off to Mary Ellen. Hi everyone, I'm Mary Ellen Cubitt. I am the story editor and producer of a broadcast podcast called Arts and Letters Radio, recorded here in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I'm on faculty at the University of Central Arkansas School of Communication. Hi, everybody. I'm very delighted to be here. My name is Jim Ambusky. I'm a historian and senior producer at R2 Studios, which is part of the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. You can check us out at r2studios.org. Uh, I have the, the pleasure of working with a number of different podcast projects at our center and our studio, but the one you see behind me, which is my baby, Worlds Turned Upside Down, which is a history of the American Revolution, uh, it is out now on all major podcast networks, and I'm delighted to be talking with all of you about the craft of podcasting and, and learning from each of your experiences. Uh, hi, I'm Nick Montgomery. Uh, I'm a, a philosopher turned sound designer, um, and I founded the Pramana Language Lab, uh, which is just a my own kind of studio where we do podcasts and most audio projects. I work a lot in arts communities. Um, and I've been podcasting now for about 
five years with lots of different projects. Uh, and um, I love sound design and weird noises uh, and how they fit together. Great. Thank you all so much. So in contrast to the first two sessions, we're going to try to make this a bit of an open discussion between the four of us until about 3.20, and then we'll open up to everybody here. And I wanted to start us off with the topic of when it comes to crafting a podcast episode, what's our approach to the concept of natural sounds, sounds as they already exist in the world versus cleaning them up a little bit. So if I were to get a new piece of audio that I was considering putting into my episode. My default in Adobe Audition would be to go through noise processing and reduce background noise, kill the mic rumble, I'd do match loudness to minus 16 loudness units, and I would do some declicker. In addition, I'm thinking of one particular episode that was a bit of like ice cream Armageddon in my household. My grandfather was eating from a bowl of ice cream and it was clinking all through a, a group audio piece that we were doing. And a few members of my family were absolutely livid. And all I had to do was go into Adobe Audition and use my brush tool strategically to minimize those noises. And it was all smoothed over. And so that to me is the power of being able to craft audio. And as much as I respect the idea of leaving audio as it is in its original form, I'm very grateful for the option to um, reduce certain sounds. What's your guys' take on a natural versus working with the audio to clean it up, so to speak. I'll jump in. I I clean up the audio a lot. I mean, you want to, in my mind, one of the things we try to achieve with our shows is a pleasant listening experience. And certainly since I've become a, a podcaster, my ears now listen to everything differently. And so I can hear every accursed thing that is wrong in the audio. And so I make it my personal mission in life to try to, to get it out as much as I can. Now, you can't always do that, right? There are certain sounds you're never gonna be able to get out. There's gonna be the random lawnmower that passes by the studio at, at a unfortunate moment that uh, you won't be able to completely get out. But uh, in, in almost every respect, we try to uh, eliminate as much of the, let's call it negative energy that we can from the audio and uh, allow people to enjoy a less mouth clicky, less uh, uh, sibilance experience. Um, and uh, and hopefully, hopefully we do, but that's what we strive for. And so in my project, I work with my partner, Jay Bradley Minnick, and uh, really our philosophy is what is enhancing or distracting from the storytelling? And that for us is the deciding factor. Is this enhancing our storytelling or is it something that is distracting from our storytelling? Uh, yeah, I think that's the nail on the head really is, um, and we may be confusing, uh, let me be the philosopher here and go for we're, we're conflating our terms. Um, we may be confusing a couple of things, but when we talk about what an audio wave is and what a sound is, um, anyone who's uh, ventured into the, um, depths of phenomenology knows that uh, individuating sounds is hard um, talking about because we experience them in very different ways. Um, and then when you get behind the scenes and you start to what I like to call crack open the hood of the audio. So I often record in lots of ambient and natural environments. So we go out to the thing and that's not just because I'm recording people, but I'm often looking for those ambient sounds. I record animals and I record um, uh, what it sounds like on top of a mountain and uh, what it sounds like to walk through or past a waterfall, things like that. So um, when you talk about what a natural sound is, well, not all of that is the disturbances of all the, the, all the air around you. If I want to focus on the waterfall, it means editing out some other things so that we can get a clearer, crisper understanding of that natural sound. Um, when the sound stops being natural, so you can edit it down as much as you want and maintain that natural sound as you try to think about what that sound would sound like anywhere not just um, uh, in the place that you heard it or recorded it, but they say, hey, if you will, a kind of universal of it. Um, uh, when, once you kind of do that, the next question is, then what do you do with it? Um, you can do anything with that signal. You can run it through a voice changer and make it sound even stranger. You can, uh, I mean, one of my favorite things to do, I did a podcast in which we played a game called The Cypher System. Uh, and uh, it was a uh, it was a time travel thing. And we all had dinosaur companions um, in this like role-playing game. So I used tons and tons of bird noises 
uh, to em emulate the dinosaur sounds. And then I would, you know, warp those sounds very slightly to give them a kind of huskier or trillier sound, more frightening sound than some of your, just your normal little hot cry, uh, things like that. So that's certainly not a natural sound. And yet I was trying to emulate one. I was trying to think about what does the dinosaur sound like? Um, and, uh, and I just have that first, that first, um, uh, Jurassic Park to thank for that one, right? And they, they have the little larynx and he blows through and it's great. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, I think that there's, there's a lot to be said about what you're looking for, but there's just no better uh, arbiter for this kind of decision than your ear, uh, than your ear and then what you're doing. Uh, that's the best thing that you can possibly guide. That's the best thing I can possibly guide you is, did that sound good? Or maybe you were going for a harsh sound and maybe that sounded bad and it rubbed off on the ears and that's what you want your audience to experience. Yeah, that's what you're looking for. Yeah, I'm so curious about your relationship with breath and with silence. I find myself increasingly, when I'm trying to be humorous, cutting out a lot of the silence and make things faster and faster. And I can't help but wonder if that's a mistake sometimes. It's a very common thing. So um, particularly in humor. <laughs> so. Uh, I was going to save this joke for later, but now you've just brought it up, right? Um, so, uh, uh, Rebe uh, Rebecca, let me bother you. Ask me what the secret to comedy is. Nick, what's the secret to comedy? Timing. Um, so, the, the, and timing is, is the truth, too. Uh, so you can replace that with podcasting and thinking about what sounds follow each other, how quickly and what they do and how that affects things. So, for instance, when you want punchy dialogue, um, when you want people to sound uh, like they're responding quickly and that they're being sharp and fast, kind of like on a sitcom or something along those lines, it's very common to speed up the audio. Um, that also helps remove some of those silences and pauses and breaths. Uh, it moves them through a little bit faster. If you listen to certain podcasts, you maybe can start to pick up on this. Um, a very common one you can probably hear is uh, uh, McElroy Brothers. Uh, when they do many of their things like the Adventure Zone or My Brother, My Brother and Me, they like to sound punchy. And so they'll bump it up just a little bit. Um, commonly, when I do that, I bump up the speed maybe about like 0.02. Um, it's a very, very subtle, very subtle speed. So you don't lose that natural sound. And it's, again, your ear here because it's going to depend on who's talking. So when I talk uh, with my <laughs> with my Wolfman voice, uh, <laughs> the uh, it's, a, it's a different kind of thing than uh, compared to, say, when I, uh, when I record my pastor wife. Um, who has a very different way of, of talking and, and doing things. So yeah, that, that's one way to do it. You can definitely speed up and slow down audio. Um, I delete a lot of breaths. I'll, I'll, I'll say that. And I often struggle with that as someone who does love natural things. Cause there's also, there's certain things, there's certain breaths you want. I've heard so many people sigh at a very important point. I see Jim like shaking his head, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like there's some, sometimes we communicate through that. Other times we're just breathing or <laughs> like we ran out of breath because we got excited about what we were talking about or something like that. And it can distract. So I, and I go through, I'm, I'm editing an audio book right now for a client. And so I'm going through and editing out lots and lots of breaths. Um, D breaths are helpful. Um, if you have the RX suite, uh, that can help a little bit, but it's again, your ear because our breaths are all different. Um, and so that'll catch some of them. Uh, and if you have someone who does that a lot, um, that'll help. But for the most part, you probably want to go through it yourself and, uh, edit or at least that's what i do yeah we do something similar we eliminate a lot of breaths but to your point nick uh you know in certain moments breaths can be so powerful because they and to mary ellen to your point right they serve the story in ways that you you would lose something fundamental if you took it out i mean we we have an upcoming episode where oh actually we, we just published an episode episode two of worlds where one of our scholars was ruminating on the appointment of uh, a Scottish Lord as British commander in chief, who was just completely unsuited for the job he was appointed to. And the scholar sighs as if he was personally affronted that this guy had been appointed. And it's, it was kind of a hilarious moment where you really kind of understood um, how uh, in some sense, even in the present day, 250 years later, this guy was exasperated by the choice that the British government made to appoint this guy who had no business being in charge of the British army. And it, it, it changed the audio in ways, or it changed the story in ways that I had not anticipated. Uh, and I got a really sort of magical moment out of it as a consequence of that. Now, we leave a lot of breaths in um, unless they're distracting, like if it's a right or a sudden breath that's going to distract someone. But otherwise, we leave a lot of them in just so we get the human sound 
Um, but we might bring them down really, really low. So they're there, but not fronted in the audio. But we do leave a lot of those in. And I think the last thing I'd want to bring up before we hit 320 is to talk about music a little bit. Mary Ellen, I definitely want to make sure that we get a shout out to what you guys do with your podcasting and music. I'd be curious to hear from all of you, how do you employ music for ambiance, for atmosphere? How does it enhance or work with the voice? I have found myself that if my default in the past was to use just a single piece of music to open and, and close out a piece, now I'm using more like two or three in order to transition to a new mood, a new atmosphere within a, within a piece. So um, we are in Arkansas now. In Arkansas, we're in the big city, Little Rock, but to the rest of the country, Little Rock is still very rural. So we use um, a lot of local and regional musicians to do our songs. One, because we can afford to purchase the uh, uh, license to then air them on our podcast. Um, but also because it gives our show a, a, it grounds it in a real authentic, true sound of our community. And, um, you know, that doesn't, it's Arkansas. So that doesn't mean the music's going to be all, you know, like banjos and thumping on a gut bucket, right? Which is what people can think of when they think of Arkansas. We use musicians of every genre, blues, jazz, classical. Um, we'll bring in a cellist. Um, kind of all just is it mostly our, our, our goal is uh, to have them here in uh, the central Arkansas region. So it gives our show a really authentic feel. We also commission a lot of music. A good portion of our small budget goes to pay local musicians. And so we will, let's say we're working on it right, right, right now we're doing a show on a love story between, between two Arkansas highway workers. Um, from a novel by Steve Yates called Sandy and Wayne. And so we will send the book to a local musician, like from Fayetteville, Arkansas. We send it to Ashton Barbary and uh, she's read the novel and um, she's written four songs for us based on that novel. And then sometimes what we'll do, since there's Sandy and Wayne in that show, we'll have Sandy, we'll have Ashton do some music, and then we'll ask a, another local musician, typically led uh, maybe from a male voice, to kind of give Wayne a feel, like Wayne kind of give him a soundtrack, a sound, or a soundscape in the show as well. So that's one thing, and when and since the thing is keeping it local, we really do a lot of, uh, we work with a lot of local musicians, and we find that really helps advance our storytelling. Yeah, we work with some local artists as well. So one of the other shows that we produce is called The Green Tunnel. It's a history of the Appalachian Trail. And we've been very fortunate to work with local artists in Virginia to try to capture some mountain music and fiddles and, and, and whatnot. But yeah, each show is different. And so, you know, for my show, which is set in the 18th century, I've got the problem where I don't like 18th century music. I actually think it's boring or, or I, I don't like the harpsichord. It drives me nuts. Uh, and so what do you do with that? Um, how, you know, we want to try to make the show as um, quote unquote authentic as we can, but given my um, dislike for that, can I find music that is evocative of the 18th century? So a lot of strings, a lot of violins, cellos, things like that that we can employ to serve the story and enhance the emotional tone of the moment, which raises a whole set of questions because you know, one of the things we have to be conscious about as historians is not change the meaning of a text, not, uh, not misrepresent uh, a text or the history that we're telling. And so can we find appropriate music that meets the emotional energy of a of a source that we've incorporated, of the dialogue or the, the narration that we've written to advance the story and not turn, you know, what should be a very dramatic moment into a, a humorous moment, for example. So we we actually use Artlist.io and a couple other sound banks to find a lot of our music for that particular show and others. But in some instances, as I said, with the Green Tunnel, uh, we're very fortunate to try to uh, use local music to put people in the mindset of Appalachia. It strikes me that what you're talking about, Jim, is kind of like trying to find affective or emotional authenticity 
in something that might not be of the time, but is evocative of the time, rather than presenting something that's limited in its factuality. Yeah, it's a it, it's an excellent observation, and I'll give you a concrete example of kind of our struggle. Uh, you know, there are a lot of shows that will use the fife and drum. You know, we've all heard colonial Williamsburg music type stuff. Um, the problem with that for me is that, uh, and I, I related to an experience. I'm actually at Williamsburg right now, and I related to an experience I had about ten years ago, where I was at Colonial Williamsburg. I was behind a building, and like every day or every two days, they have a, a regiment march through. Um, playing the fife and drum. Now, you can physically feel those sound waves coming through you, which was the intent of those uh, instruments in the 18th century. You cannot replicate that in many respects uh, uh, in a podcast. And so I sort of shy away from using that kind of music because for me, there's no way that I can actually convey to you what it's like to feel those drums pounding through your chest as that regiment's approaching. Um, it would be nice if I could replicate what Bostonians might have felt as regiments marched into town in 1768, um, but I unfortunately I can't, and so I choose to use the music that's evocative, so that I can go for the more sort of emotional as opposed to the physical reaction. Yeah, well, I'll, oh sorry, sorry, if I could go right ahead. Nope, Nick, all you, and then we'll transition to questions. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I just want to chime in because I love I love music. Uh, I love putting that's that's really what got me into this as I, you know, the first thing I did was uh, just doing a D&D &D podcast with my friends. And then you start putting background noise in it. And then uh, then you're a sound designer. It happens just like that. Um, and so you start thinking really hard about uh, what that does. So I just wanted to uh, maybe give two little pieces of advice that, that are very helpful for me when it comes to using sound and stuff. So sound non cognitive sounds that is sounds are that are not words that have a meaning to them, um, do two things for us primarily. Uh, they evoke imagery and they evoke mood and emotion. Uh, those are the, and those things should be regarded as kind of separate. Of course, some images can give us moods and feelings, but often we get moods and feelings without images. So when Jim wants to evoke the, the feeling of what it might be like um, uh, to hear those drums and things like that, right? Uh, that, that we might be evoking a certain kind of imagery. What, what, what do they see when they do that? Um, and so when you make a script for your podcast, I strongly recommend that you make three columns um, and that you have the original... Um, whatever your script is, we can talk more about what that script is, whether that's a transcript from your interviews, whether it's something you scripted ahead of time. Uh, and then you have a second column where you have imagery and mood. And as you read through your script, you have to think about what do you want your audience to think and feel in these cases? What do you want these two words, or where do you want these words to go with, right? Um, and what that actually means is, so when you do music production, there's what's the, the most simplest thing that you do is called a texture. So you put two different sounds over top of each other. And that makes a new sound and it affects us in different ways than the original sound did. And we do that every single time we put a word behind a sound. So um, uh, you have to think uh, immediately. It's not just intro, outro, right? Many, many of my clients, when I talk to them, they just, I just want intro, outro music, right? I don't want to, in my interview shows in the middle, but truly good shows have something that helped your audience along with the words in these ways. So I strongly recommend um, uh, using those couple of things and thinking about them dynamically. So then you, your third column, you place the actual music, the actual sounds that you will be doing, that'll be doing the evoking. So you can sort of make sure that you're on track with stuff and watching it, right? Um, uh, so I, I, yeah, I really recommend that kind of stuff. It's, uh, it's the most fun. And I just wanted to share a little quote because uh, this is so, it, like, if you're, if you're uh, I find a lot of people who want to do podcasts often get very like spooked about music or we, we need to find free stuff and it's hard to find licensing and this kind of thing, but um, you don't need too much. So, uh, you know, uttering a word is like striking a note on the keyboard of the imagination. So that's Ludwig Wittgenstein. Um, and when our, we do those words, when we have those breaths and things like that, there's, there's a musical and tonal quality to them that um, is lost when they're on the page. And it's just something to consider and, and, and to think about as we go through that there's, there's dynamics to what's going on here beyond sort of the surface semantics. Um, and it's just, uh, and there's no way to really keep track of it. You just have to sort of understand it uh, and write it out as best you can. Well, uh, with that, I think we're ready to transition into Q&A. Nick, I had promised that you get the first dibs on the first question. So if you'd like to scroll through the chat, or if there's anybody in the audience that wants to raise their hand and unmute and ask a question, feel free to do so now. You know what? Let's um, just because I saw it's like the first question and I got like a thousand uh, thumbs up. Let's um, yes, I saw it uh, appear. So 
with the amount of editing for breath and sound pauses, this is uh, Daniel Dissinger, uh, uh, for breath and sound pauses, what is your release schedule and how long does it take you to edit an episode? I'm the sole editor of my podcast and I have went from doing a lot of editing to basically almost none. Yeah, um, and so I, I would say one, one of the best things that you can do if you have a schedule of those things is that you break these pieces apart. I'm, I'm, I'm the sole editor for many shows uh, that my clients do and, and that I do my own stuff on the side. I produce serially. Uh, because you know, ain't nobody got time for that. So um, I just wanted to, but this is my advice. This is the advice I give to all clients and, and anyone who's doing this. And this is just that you have to do it. You have to do this or life will burn you out. Bank four. If you have an idea and you think that this can be a real podcast, bank four episodes. Don't post them. Don't publish them. Finish them. Listen to them. And then publish them on your basis for either a week or a biweekly basis or even a monthly basis. Then you have breathing room. Then you have you know what it takes to make a production schedule, and now you have a whole month banked. Um, and so then when life comes up, and like you know, grandma slips and falls, and you've got to take her to the hospital that weekend, you still got an episode to go, and you've got a little you've got grace for yourself. Um, if that's the kind of schedule you're looking for, um, uh, Rebecca notes that with her with her podcast and similar to the kinds of things that if you do them serially might take you a very long time you say about nine months per episode yeah i mean if you're doing local recording and you've got to get lots of different found material and you're splicing that together be ready for it to take a long time it's okay um uh, your project's worth it uh you know uh, <laughs> so uh, we and we can talk a little bit more about um i think the there's definitely a big push right among spotify and other platforms to be like you need to be releasing weekly you need to be releasing regularly you need to be engaging in these very particular ways and that's i mean as a false narrative, but maybe we can save that for another kind of thing. Um, so the main thing is that you feel comfortable and healthy, making sure that you can get it out. So I, and then, yeah, if you're doing all of that work, I would say if you have your presets together and you're doing a, th a three minute to, or 30 minute to 50 minute episode, I typically don't take more uh, than an hour if I've got that episode marked and with a good script uh, to be able to go through it uh, with plug in help and that kind of thing. Um, that's, that's typically about what it works at. But again, that's like practice and having everything set and ready to go when you sit down. I love the bank four idea. I banked three of the episodes in Barry Bunch Picks Flicks, and I needed every single one of those weeks yeah. to get the next two in shape. So that's a great idea. Yeah. I'm curious to hear Jim and Mary Ellen's take on this question, because I think you guys have a team now. So it's not one person doing all the editing by themselves, right? How do you avoid burnout? And how do you find that that assists in cutting down a certain time or freeing up some time to do other tasks to prepare your episodes? Uh, it's a great question, and it's one we don't have a great answer to yet, quite frankly. Uh, we are very fortunate to be part of a university and a part of a history department, but we only have two full-time people in our studio, and we're very fortunate. Uh, and I see Amber Pelamon here, one of our excellent graduate students, to assist us in the studio. And, and so one of the things actually we're trying to work out is how do we get to a bank for a scenario that Nick outlines, uh, in part uh, because you know we're managing three shows right now. We'll have a fourth coming out next year. And we need to keep growing in, in some ways to attract, you know, financing and, and attention and, and advertisers and things like that to, uh, to uh, enhance our business model. Uh, and so we are, I mean, you know, quite, quite frankly, you know, we're sort of teetering on the edge of burnout, but, uh, but we have to keep going in order to sort of make this work. Now, I, I think we may in the next year and a half find ourselves being able to achieve a kind of bankable status uh, because we're, we're working with some folks who will afford us uh, some, some greater um, time to completion. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's an excellent question and it's a real, uh, I think it's a wonderful thing to think about as you're planning these projects, how do you make them sustainable? How do you make yourself sustainable? Uh, and how do you ensure that you're doing both while constantly elevating the quality of your product? So Mary Ellen, if you've got some ideas as well, I'd love to hear them. <laughs> we are just starting our 10th season. So um, we've, and um, I totally understand that question. Um, we also do not do this full-time, right? We're both full-time academics. So, um, and really there's three of us and on our team. There's um, Jay Bradley Minnick, 
who is our executive producer and host, myself as story editor and producer, and then uh, Joseph Fuller, who does our audio engineering and mastering, and then a lot of our our music sound effects and soundscapes. Um, so yeah, and we're typically doing um, multiple episodes at the same time. The earlier question, how many do you do? Um, we've done as many as 18 episodes in one year, um, but we probably do about 10 episodes a year now. We don't we don't um, do an episode every week, but we have over 110 shows now. So, um, you know, we have a lot in the queue and uh, we are a podcast, but we're also broadcast on the NPR affiliate here in central Arkansas and then their affiliate NPR stations in the state so um we run arts and letters classics right <laughs> i stole that from snap judgment snap judgment calls their repeats classics so that's what we'll do when we have um when we're not ready for a new episode because we would um you know my partner jay bradley minnick would rather wait a week and make sure the show is ready and the best we can get it done than force it um, a week early. And we also work really far in advance. So um, right now we're recording for episodes that will be released next fall, fall of 24, even spring of 25 is where we're recording now. So we don't do time oriented programs. So people don't come on and you know, to promo their new book. And then we get the show out next week. We really try and work on evergreen uh, programs, meaning that they always sound timely. So we don't mention a lot of years or, or um, you know, unless it's directly in relation to the show, we don't mention a lot of current events. Um, and uh, so we work really far ahead since, again, since we're both academics, we have a tendency to record a lot over the summer. And then we work on production throughout the year um, is kind of our, our typical pattern. So I don't know if that helps, but that that has helped us um, stay on track. Awesome. Jim, I think you got next dibs on question. Yeah, actually, uh, Alexis Thomas uh, says, I'm an undergrad working on a campus history project, and I'm working on a proposal for a podcast for this narrative. Where's the best place to start for beginners in terms of learning how to edit and do sound design? Uh, which is a terrific question and also uh, good for you, Alexis, in, in getting involved uh, as an undergraduate. That's uh, very exciting, I think, uh, for those of us who work in this field, uh, thinking about the next generation. And I guess I'll take a first stab. I mean, one of the things that really helped me when I was uh, starting in 2019 uh, and I was started out at George Washington's Mount Vernon. I was hired in part to host their podcast and had some editing help and then suddenly did not have editing help. And one of the things I found very instructive is if you have access to it um, and uh, a LinkedIn learning is a great place to start um, because I use Adobe Audition for my digital audio workstation and they have an excellent, very sort of beginner's tutorial on how to use uh, Adobe Audition. Uh, to edit your podcast and uh, and also a good uh, sort of overview on sound design. But then YouTube has also been my friend uh, besides colleagues. Uh, if I have a, a problem I don't quite understand, if I, if I Google it, uh, inevitably somebody has a quick YouTube um, video that will show me how to do something. But I think, uh, you know, at least for me, starting out is a great place with, with those LinkedIn learning courses. And I would say, Alexis, if you're somebody who learns best by being with other people, more and more there are college and university campuses in which there are learn how to podcast courses taught by professors and professors who want interns and other people to help them make their own podcast. So some of it's going to be pick it up as you go. And I would also say that you should see if your college has a media center, just ask a librarian. They would know if they have one. And I think um, Nick can probably speak to this, but often colleges have amazing studios and resources that just kind of go unused. So if you ask about that, I'm sure they would be delighted to help you. And your local library as well. Many local libraries have fantastic sound studios and even can rent some equipment and stuff to you. Um, I wonder if the student wants to maybe even just chime in and say what would they have available? Like, uh, cause I, I want to echo Jim very quickly that, that YouTube's your friend, like 
most of the DAWs, most of the digital audio workstation, most of the editing platforms that you will use have very large communities in which they are friendly and they help each other. So I learned on Reaper. Um, I got sick of Audacity too quick and Reaper has been great. It's definitely not super user-friendly out of the box, but what is, is the community that is like, hey, hey, bro, hey, King, like, let's, let's help you out. And like tons and tons of anything that you want to figure out for YouTube. Uh, so whatever DAW or platform you're using, as long as it's um, maybe not one of the more recent ones, if it's been around for a little bit, just YouTube it, Reddit it, look online. These, so someone's had your problem before and they want to help you. Yeah, Alexis, are you here and able to unmute and talk to us a little bit more about what project you have in mind? Yeah, sure. Um, hello, I'm Alexis Thomas. Uh, I go to Clemson University. And I think some of you guys um, might know my advisor, Dr. Sarah Collini, who went to um, George Mason. Um, so we're working on um, a project on Clemson. There's a, a cemetery on campus and we just discovered over 500 unmarked graves of African-American and formerly enslaved people. Um, and so I'm the undergraduate research assistant. And right now we're working on creating a proposal for um, a podcast to tell that narrative. So any other advice you guys might have would be really great. Alexis, I've got, I, am. I don't know if you came in, but I posted uh, a couple of things right at the beginning of the chat that are two documents that may be useful to you. It's just a podcast pr a process kind of thing. Um, and uh, also a gear list. Um, if you're, if you want to like look through stuff or see if there certain things are available to you, or if you want to like email me or something later, I'd really, but I, I do this a lot. This, this is what I, this is often what I do is talk with folks for a free one hour consultation and help them get set up for what, kind of what gear they have. So what a cool project. What a cool project. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And I'll say the same thing. Well, one, say hi to Sarah for me. Uh, Cause I haven't seen her for a while. And two, uh, yeah. Um, have her touch base with us, uh, you know, at, at uh, for alma mater, cause we, we'd love to talk and, and we're very, I mean, I've been following that project for a while since she got that job. And so I'm really, really pleased to hear that you're a part of it and um, congrats. And it sounds like a great, great opportunity. Yeah. Thank and, you and, so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. In case this isn't clear from what Jim and Nick are saying, they think it's an amazing idea for a podcast. And you should absolutely pursue this. <laughs> awesome. Mary great. Ellen, you Thank wanna... you guys. No problem. Mary Ellen, you want to call Jim to the question? I'll dive in the question about music and licensing and how much we pay. Um, now we work on a very small budget. We're not flush with cash. So we, that's a conversation and a negotiation that we have with each artist. And I will leave it at, it really depends on the market in your area. So obviously um, paying a musician in LA or Chicago or Miami is going to be on a much different scale than paying a musician from Malvern, Arkansas. Um, so no, there is that factor. And then we pay per song if the song is already produced and cut and we're going to use it, it for, uh, you know, 15 seconds or, or from, from like 15 to maybe 40 seconds. We have one rate that we'll pay for that. We do pay for someone to write a song for us. We pay then per song and then they give us license to use it in that program and in all the program promotions and then any affiliated program that might refer back to that one across all platforms. Um, we have that language in there. Um, to answer the question, yes, there are sample contracts out there. You can look to if you're looking for some music rates and in general, um, freelance rates through AIR. AIR is the um, independence in radio. It's kind of like a public media independent producer, professional organization. They are very, very helpful with some of their resources and especially in national standards of what to pay someone for mixing, what to pay for someone for mashing, what to pay, how, you know, how much should you pay for tape syncs, that kind of thing. So we use that. Um, so I hate to give you a dollar amount, but, um, you know, you can think of, about $800, depending upon um, what they're doing. We'll even sometimes pay people for sound effects if we're looking for sound effects or a certain soundscape. And it, so it depends how much. Two sound effects or three sound effects might be $150 if it's just some small sound effects. So it, it depends on um, what you're asking to do, how much time it will take them. And then um, 
to, one thing to note, we do not own the copyright to those songs. We just license the use for it. So that is something very, so even if we ask a musician to write music for us, the musician still maintains the ownership of that song and they do just license us to use it. Now, we also do not pay royalties. So that is known upfront um, because we're not the kind of show that has royalties to distribute. So uh, that's something we also know it's a one-time fee only for uh, working with us. I am interested in this question from Kara about how do we market our podcast and have any of us tried doing paid social media campaigns and did we find that it helped anything? And um, does anybody have experience being part of a podcast network? So I have not done a hardcore marketing campaign. This first one that I launched on my own is just for me and my family. And if other people listen in, that's a bonus for me. But I will say that a lot of us are connected to university-based podcasts. And the reason that the one I was attached to at UVA got nominated for a Webby and gets 3,000 listens a month, as opposed to usually 1,000 or lower for most of the other university podcasts, is that they very explicitly made it a topic and a concept that's appealing to people not just in Charlottesville, Virginia. I think virtually all university podcasts are oriented toward trying to get people at the university to listen. But if you can make it something that's appealing to people nationally or globally, you have a much better shot of becoming something that becomes a mainstay for people in many different locations. And yes, I am part of two podcasting networks, I would say. <laughs> I've got the HPN that I'm part of that is running this event. And I am um, also hoping to start up a New Haven area one for which I've had some really fabulous people um, express interest. And I think it's totally worth it to try to find out if there are podcasting collectives in your area partly to avoid the burnout and to avoid the feeling that you're just podcasting into a void and you have no idea where your work is going. Um, and partly because it gives you connections, it gives you research, it gives you tips. Every time that you come across something that is a block in your road, say you are just not finding the right piece of music or there's an edit that you really wanna make and you can't find, figure out how to make it, a five minute conversation with somebody is usually all that's needed to undo a block that was taking you weeks to do otherwise. So I would highly recommend reaching out if you want to find out that this is a local podcast or anywhere else. Does anybody else want to speak to marketing? Yeah, we've we've had some experience. I've had experience at, at two institutions now with social media marketing in terms of paid advertising. So when I was at Mount Vernon, we were uh, promoting a podcast called Intertwine, the Enslaved Community at George Washington's Mount Vernon. And we used a, a kind of a three-tiered approach of Facebook slash Instagram ads. We experimented very briefly with Twitter uh, back when Twitter you know, was actually operational in some sense, uh, and then audio ads uh, for other podcasts. And the, the Twitter ads was not worth it, we found, uh, but in both in, at Mount Vernon and at George Mason, where we've also done Facebook ads, we found those extraordinarily effective and extraordinarily cost-effective. Uh, I think we spent uh, in our most recent campaign at George Mason, we spent about 500 bucks and we got, you know, tens of thousands of impressions and boosted our listenership for the Green Tunnel, uh, but then also brought them into our own ecosystem of our other shows. Um, and so we've been, we, we found it to be very effective. Uh, there are newer um, opportunities with uh, apps like Headliner uh, and some other platforms like that. We've also seen some promise in those, uh, but it seems like right now meta products are, are particularly effective in the social media realm if you're going to go to a, the paid advertisement uh, route. Oh, Rich, we would love to hear your question. Uh, thank you so much. So this is really uh, super interesting and informative, and I've learned a lot already. So I have two podcasts, and one has, I think, I don't count, 180 episodes, which is an enormous amount of content. I have no funding for it at all, although I'm at New York University, one would think. It's a pretty big place. And I just wanted to say two things. First of all, on the network, my podcast is hosted by the New Books Network. Uh, which has totally been a super successful partnership. I just give it to them and it has enormous amounts of listeners because they have a lot of followers. I don't have to do anything. 
My other podcast, I have another podcast that get, got picked up by Heart Media, which is commercial. They promote it through Starbucks apps. Um, yay, I think it's really great. They found me, they contacted me. I kind of said, fine, let's do this. But I don't look at the numbers. I actually do not live my life. And I stopped that to look at which episode went well. And I can tell you, nonetheless, I'm kind of lying a little bit. I know which episodes do really well, but I don't really look at my numbers every week anymore. It's just, I think, a bad habit. And it actually is, in a way, not really what I'm doing it for. I'm not doing it just for quantity. And the other thing I wanted to say, sort of everybody who sort of talked earlier about editing, I really admire all these skills. And I have practically none of them. And I also have no funding. So I've actually had to opt into what Daniel said, that I put relatively little time into editing for sound, and partly because I have a conversation-based podcast that's a natural conversation, and two things happen. First of all, content really trumps everything. So if the content is important and the guest is important, I think I can live with an audio quality that's fine, but that's really not gold standard at, by any means, by any of what you're producing, which is really professional. I just can't do it because I don't have the money to do it to pay people. And secondly, I've also, my podcast is a really different type of podcast. It's conversation based. And I have guests completely derail my entire preparation because they came up with one thing and we went in a totally different direction. And those were the most valuable to me because they talked about, I'll give you one example. I talked about Ralph Ellison, Invisible Man, and I wanted to hear all of this. And then John Callahan, who is a literary executor, talked to me about the first meeting he had with Ralph Ellison and Fanny Ellison in Harlem. And we spent a half an hour on that. And I felt I was recording an oral history of a moment in time. But I hadn't planned for that. It wasn't supposed to happen. But I learned a lot in doing literally an enormous amounts of interviews. I don't do interviews. I follow what they're saying. And then I say, can I go back to what you just said? And can I go back to what you just said? which is a really hard thing to do. You have to have a lot of familiarity with who these people are. I do an enormous amount of preparation. But once I'm in there, I kind of let them take the lead and say, we're going in this direction. And I usually also, I'll just finish here. I usually ask when someone says something that seems very obvious to an academic or to a sort of an artist, and they say, well, this was when Simone de Beauvoir's book came out. It really sort of was the first wave of feminism. I say, Kate Stimson, just for a moment, can you just tell me again what was first wave feminism? And when they double back on a on a word they used, two things happen. They feel comfortable that now they're talking about something they referenced. And otherwise, people are a little bit apprehensive that I'm going to come with, with some super smart question that they have to now respond to on the, on the spur of the moment. So they say, oh, he's referring to something I just said. I'm reflecting on myself, which is very different from I'm responding to that. But that all means... I prepare a lot, but I don't really stick to a script. And then I can't spend that, that much time editing. All my time goes into preparation and making that guest feel comfortable. And that takes an enormous amount so I can reference their book. I read this, I do know this. Um, and the promotion part, social media, as I think Jim said, uh, paying, paying any of the social media platforms hasn't worked at all. I think it's useless, to be honest. I think to find your natural kind of connection to other people who are your listeners. And your listeners, I think, are the drivers the people who are engaging with it, who are responding, who are telling people about the podcast, like all of us, I'm sure. All the podcasts I know is because I listen to this group. I'm part of this network. And people say, oh, this is a good podcast. And I write it down and then look it up. And that's it's word of mouth rather than a kind of um, social media presence. I think Professor Bear brings up a good point here in say, that... Say Uli or Ulrich, please. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, Thank many you. of us don't do humanities podcasting to make money. I mean, we're not in this as a con commercial in endeavor. We're not trying to, you know, sell our product. We're not trying to take our humanities podcast and, you know, pitch it to Gimlet or, you know, Audible or, or some of those big um, distribution uh, companies. Um, but there are some strategies that you can use to try not to spend your own money. And if, you know, people want to hang out in the chat afterward, we can talk about some of those, like we, we do operate on a small budget, but if you think about, you get money from three groups, you get money from the federal and state government, you get money from corporations and foundations, and then you get money from people. Those are the three kind of revenue sources for any kind of broadcast. Um, now, I did see Daniel's note in there about the University of South Carolina wanting to own his podcast if they fund it. 
And that is a huge uh, discussion that would be really great to have as well and chat about this idea of like, cause we would say never let anybody own your work, never let anybody own your RSS feed except for you. Um, but um, yeah, those are some options. And uh, if you want, we can talk a little bit about how to find some small resources. If you're affiliated with a university, um, and you want to get donations for your project from people in general, you can ask your university's development office to set you up a gift fund, and then they'll put it on part of their online giving platform. That's what we do. And then when someone says they want to make a donation, um, we send them the university uh, donation link to Arts and Letters Radio Gift Fund. And I mean, those are not huge donations, but $100 here, $500 here. Every now and then we'll get a $1,000 gift. Those kind of things make huge differences in our budget, but they're just small gifts from some people. So that's also something you can think of if you're affiliated with a nonprofit or with a university. Um, you can speak to their development office and maybe set yourself up a gift fund through um that giving arm and then they'll give you a digital link that you can then put out on social media and share with people who are interested in supporting your show. I wanted to briefly address Ayani's question about why would you sometimes do scripting before you get to the mixing and mastering stage? I have an interesting visual to provide that I wonder if it will be helpful. So on the right hand of my screen here is the transcript from an episode that we did that was about 90 minutes and I had to cut it down to 45 minutes. When I listen to the whole thing, I mark in red anything that's kind of superfluous that I think can go. Anything that you see that's in my gold highlight means that was a golden nugget. That stays for sure. And not only does it stay in, I then shape the respondent's entire answer around that to make it stand out more, to make it sort of the thesis or the highlight of the entire piece. And so a document like this is what I think of when I think of scripting prior to do the mixing and mastering, because you're choosing your golden nugget bits of audio that then you shape the narrative around everything else. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I, you might be saying that because you're looking at my chart in which I've got it sit right there. There's also another reason why you might do that, right? And which you might put that well before that, but before the actual recording process, if you're doing audio dramas. Uh, many of you will start a, a script when you start making interview questions. Uh, just go ahead and put that in there and get ready to fill it in uh, with the script. So scripting is a process that goes through it. Why I strongly recommend that you have a script ready to go uh, prior to mixing and mastering is because that's your guide. Um, and I'm I'm over 35 and my, my brain doesn't work like it used to. I mean, you used to be able to keep a whole idea in your head and you remember like, oh, I want the cool sound to go there and I want this to happen here. And it's just not, it doesn't work that way anymore. Um, so uh, it's really good to have a guide. It's really good to have something like that. And it also helps you think through things in a different way. Um, looking at a different modality, looking at your project through a different medium on a script allows you to see some things that you wouldn't, wouldn't hear. Um, and I think actually Rebecca is the nail on the head when she's like, I'm, you can see those words and think about what a thesis is and how you might edit that for time. Yeah, absolutely. A huge, uh, huge difference. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, but you know, you, 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 your flow is your flow and where you put the script and what the script does for you. Uh, that's important. I know plenty of audio editors who are just like, uh, you know, and they kind of know what they're doing or, 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 the, or they are putting out a project that doesn't really require much of a script. And indeed, if you're just doing a, a quick interview show and you don't really have the need, you might not need a script um, if you don't intend to edit uh, very much out of it. Um, I strongly recommend, uh, as I put in there, that everybody just should have a transcriber at this point. Um, transcriptions are becoming such a very common uh, thing among podcasts and among this kind of medium. Uh, it's also a really easy way if you want to switch over and also have a YouTube channel at the same time. Uh, it's pretty easy just to throw up a graphic and then allow your transcriptions to roll through it so that that, you know, it's our podcasts are already great for accessibility and for helping people uh, who can't see or who maybe rely more on their ears. Um, you, now you can have both. <laughs> right is is the idea. Um, and especially in so far as with the humanities network, you might be interested in educational things. It's a great idea. Great idea to transcribe, uh, even if you're not going to use it for a script. Um, yeah. Kim, did you have a question? Uh, 
I just wanted to share that I don't use scripts in my podcast and we do a ton of editing. So we record about half an hour and we publish about 15 minute episode. So we do, we cut down quite a bit. Um, and um, while I can totally see the value of having a script and I think that there is, um, you know, um, something really useful in that. Uh, as someone with a degree in literature, I spend basically all of my scholarly life editing text on a screen. And it's really nice to edit something that doesn't involve going through the written word. Um, so there are different approaches to it. Um, and I think it might, you know, you, you can get different results just by listening, um, even if, yeah, even if it maybe isn't always coming to the punch um, in the same way with the golden nuggets, that kind of thing. And, and you're, you're right, Kim, and mixing and mastering that stage, you're, you know, I say use the script, but it's a guideline, <laughs> you know, AR, it's, it's just a guideline, you know, uh, you, you will hear things and do things and, and it will change. Be open to how your sound breathes and changes uh, as you listen to it, because it'll sound different the second day you listen to it too. I would say also, if, if you're aiming for a 15 minute show, unless it was, uh, unless you had, how many tracks are you working with, Kim, typically? Ah, uh, so um, I will say that um, we keep ours really pretty clean, um, usually only two, right? Um, oh, okay. We've done uh, sometimes we have you know we don't do we don't do music um, we don't do sound effects uh, it's it's really just the interviewer and the guest um, occasionally we've had multiple guests which makes it harder but I realized that that that's the strategy of having a script is probably way more helpful if you've got a lot of different I would I would I would say a script would get in the way for your show I, you know that I honestly especially if you've got a team if there's more than one of you already doing this um scripts are very helpful for me when clients send a script because I get to go through it faster and I can acquire their vision much quicker uh, scripts are also really helpful for me because I do projects where I interview lots and lots and lots of people typically with the same interview questions that I then regroup so I transcribe them first then I regroup that into a script add my own dialogue and stuff like that in the back end and when you have 10 interviews or more particularly from wordy philosophers uh man i gotta have them i can't keep all that in my head um so uh yeah and so it's re it really depends on your project but if the script is getting in the way get out get rid of it there's no point i mean th there's there, there are no rules just make something cool that is the best thing about podcasting there are no rules <laughs> Well, not to open a can of worms, but one thing I wanted to bring up before we duck out of here is that a major topic in the concept of craft of podcasting right now has to be AI. And the fact that increasingly people are using AI for the editing, for the transcription, um, maybe even for some of the marketing and generating content itself, sometimes even for the voices. And it's not something I have played around with too much just yet. I suppose my take on it at this moment in time would be if you have an opportunity to pay a local musician, a local artist, a local voice actor, please support them to whatever extent that you can. Yeah, great advice. Uh, using AI to fill in your guests uh, speech that they didn't make is lazy podcasting. Uh, it's lazy academic work. It's lazy everything. Don't do that. Um, the AI, as we already know, is is really, really good at homogenizing everything. It's really, really good at making it so it can take your voice and it can make you make it sound like you, but it will not capture the other things that you would know that we would do certain kinds of inflections, the things that make you interesting. It would not capture Jim, those, those beautiful sighs, those breaths that you need that convey emotion. Uh, and that's what we're in the game for, man. Uh, like, uh, so anything that, uh, decreases verbal diversity uh, I'm, I'm against um we want we want weird sounds we want people talking in strange ways um and it's good for our brains because then it's like a puzzle and we have to think about it and work it out as opposed to uh you know a, a grammatically correct thing that uh the the ai is going to spit out uh, there are certainly things that can be a little more subtle and a little more careful. Uh, there's also fun reasons to use AI, right? So um, I will occasionally use AI uh, when I put things in there where uh, you, you just want a robot voice, but you don't want it to be mine or something like that. Nothing wrong with that. But you know, that's that's uh, that we're not we're not pretending to be representational in that case. We're not present. We're not pretending to say like this is a person's words. <laughs> we're very clearly to the audience saying this is not a person's words. Um, so the uh, so that's really an important thing is is um, don't don't put words in your in your audience's mouth we're, we're 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 journey we're journey people like we're experimental we're here to find out what's there not to cook the books man so yeah that's my spiel i'm done 
Katie, I see your hand. We have hit four o'clock. So anybody who needs to depart at this time, you are perfectly welcome to do so. Um, Mary Ellen, I saw you offer to somebody you're going to stick around and talk to them about grant work. Yeah. Okay. So I think a few of us are sticking around for a few more minutes. If you are um, somebody who's departing now, the next session for the HPN will begin in one hour at 5 p.m. Eastern time. If you'd like to stick around and be placed into a breakout room to meet with people and network for a little bit, you are welcome to do that as well. Milan and Kim, anything else you would add? Cool. Great. Well, thank you all so much to the people who are able to attend. If you need to leave at this time, farewell. It's great to have you. And Katie, if you'd like to ask your question now, go for super, it. Super quick question. And you just brought it up, Nick, a little bit about preserving the voice and the authentic voice. I've had, uh, I work in a lot of humanities podcasts, talking to different people from our arts and culture community here in the desert Southwest. And I had a guest one time who had a, a horrific stutter and it, yet it was such important content. And it, 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 it really raised so many flags for me, ethical questions about whether or not I remove a stutter, uh, which was fairly easy to do editing wise, time consuming, but easy relatively. Um, anyway, how do you deal with that? And when I hear you, it, it ties into something else. When I hear people deleting breaths and inserting sort of intentional interruptions and things like that, I wonder too, if that isn't, if we're not modeling a mode of communication that we'd rather actually not hear in real life. Like in real life, do you really want to be the person who's interrupting all the time or not breathing or talking nonstop without ever taking a breath? That's those are my thoughts. I definitely want to be breathing. Yeah, that's uh, that's important. I, I, uh, but um, th that's, that's so great. Um, so there's two, there's two kind of things there. Let me let me backtrack to, to the first bit. Like, what do you do about that? So I definitely have had situations uh, like that. I've had people in my studio who um, uh, are are not confident with respect to uh, their voice, either because of a verbal stutter or some other kind of tick. Um, uh, hey, what do you do about someone if you have Tourette's on, right? Uh, what do you do about those things? So the number one rule is ask them. Um, the number one rule is ask your, ask your person. You're interviewing them, you're capturing their voice. And if they feel that that stutter is a problem for conveying what they want to convey, if they feel that they would rather not be stuttering and you feel like you can help that out, you do it. Um, and you say that you did that. You either say it in your show notes or you say it ahead of time, um, just as a, as a normal record. So that's that's my rule of thumb is, uh, is uh, I'm using the word client, but uh, uh, inter interviewee autonomy. They, they, have, they have the final say about, especially when you're doing a heavily edited kind of thing, they have the final say about what goes in and what goes out. Um, and so uh, to a certain degree, of course, if you're doing a cool thing, I mean, I wouldn't give like, <laughs> there's a lot of politicians. I wouldn't give that, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, you know, give kind of courtesy to, uh, but, um, but for the most part, especially when we're interviewing people, uh, who are a part of, uh, um, indigenous communities and, and other things like that, it's, it's about making sure that they feel that their words are pr appropriately represented. And so, yeah, and sometimes it's just a, and so I would just say it's a conversation. It's ask them, and they say, no, my stutter is a part of me. I'll give you just a really quick story. Uh, my great aunt um, had a had an underbite, um, and uh, and she would uh, often tell this story about how when the traveling uh, like uh, orthodontist came through uh, Cleveland, Tennessee, at that time it was a long time ago, uh, the mother took her to, to get the underbite, uh, take a look at, and maybe have some braces done, and the doctor refused. He said, no, ma'am, I will not do this. This is her face. This is the character of her face. It does not prevent her from eating correctly, these kinds of things. I cannot, like, it would be wrong to do this because it is, you know, she, she wanted to become a, a kind of a very famous makeup artist and a number of other things and has always been elated by that doctor. I think that we live in a society where that doctor doesn't exist anymore, where we've got the tools, we feel like we can use it um, and we forget to appreciate the the kind of natural beauty the kind of natural situation of those things um also you know when you point out a study like man studies are uncomfortable but that's the representation um right and so maybe our audience will be a little bit uncomfortable with that but that's breaking through that's something that we should be representing that's something that we should be putting out there trying to pretend that doesn't exist is i think sometimes more problematic 
uh, you know, uh, in, in that way. So that's why I say just be upfront about what you're doing when you're doing it and make sure it's representing the person. But remind me a bit of your segment. I got really lost in that. Sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. My, yeah, thank you for that, that comment. I work with kids and I produce content for kids. So really my main concern is that we're comprehensible. And, um, and so, because kids, but I also hear you about, you know, the kid with the stutter in the classroom would be delighted to hear someone like themselves, but would it detract from the educational value? So I'm always considering first the educational um, mission of our work. Okay. If that's your mission. That's the right thing to consider. Like as I think, as we've all sort of said, what, that's what your goal is. If that's what your ear is attuned towards. You should do that. But you, I, I would recommend that you, uh, children is, is a bit difficult because they're not fully autonomous, but uh, you, but yeah, I mean, you can, uh, you, you should, you should ask, you should talk. I, I would say those kinds of things, but I mean, if it's totally uh, destroying the ability to make it comprehensible, of course you got to change it. You know? Right. Right. Um, uh, the second part of my question was, or really was more kind of like a comment about our responsibility to reflect the sound and the type of community. We're communicators. We're teaching communication as we create our work. Whether or not we own our role, we are influencing how other people will communicate henceforth, either from the ideas they get from what they hear from our work or even just the style. So when I was hearing about the deleting the breaths, inserting intentional interruptions, it, it, it um, rankled me a little because I, I thought this, the hyperactive pacing, especially in children's media, which I'm very in tune to, is not necessarily a boon to our, our, our well-being as a community, as a society, and as, we're, as we are engaged in, in humanities efforts, which is to try to help people understand one another. So I just wanna say, I don't think speeding up, I mean, occasionally we speed up voices to fit timing, but it might be cutting a 10th of a second, you know, for radio, um, not for podcast. And um, I just think it's, it's worth considering the modeling of the type of language we wanna hear in relation to the dialogue we're trying to create. That's all. Then I would say if that's your goal, you should take Nick's advice and keep the stutter in because that's also about timing and pacing and you know representing fidelity to how time evolves and unfurls in, in human to human conversation. I agree with Nick strongly to speak with your guest. Um, we had one instance where somebody didn't mind at all that they were stuttering and another instance where somebody said, please take that out. I really don't like how I sound. And I did so. Um, I'm interested, Nick, that you said you should mention it in the episode. I did not do so because I couldn't find an elegant way to say, uh, no, I have edited out this guest stuttering. <laughs> I, I, I'm i not sure that would do well to sort of like draw no attention elegant. to something she's asked. There's okay. no elegant way to say that. And so I would recommend in those cases, show notes, um, put it at the bottom of your show notes. Um, and say, like, talk about what you have edited uh, within it. Yeah, no, I don't, I think unless your show is about editing or something along those lines, no, I don't think you need to say it there. So I maybe, maybe use that uh, in a more uh, liquid way than I meant to. But yeah, I, I would say put it in your show notes and, and, and say, like, this is a, if they're cool with it, again, that's again, you need to talk with them about that and make sure that uh, that's okay. okay. I see Kim, like, really wanting to say, yeah, God, thank you, Nick. I appreciate that. Um, I just want to bring this part of the conversation to a close. Um, and then it, please, I will ask you guys to stick around and we'll continue the conversation, but I just want to conclude it for the sake of the recording. Um, and uh, thank you all so much for participating. I really, really appreciate it.